Okay, so now I would like to talk about the actual syllabus, the structure of the course. So there's 15 slides here and uh, should take about 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes. So in slide two, basically this is the whole layout of the course. You'll notice there's four themes. Theme one is the history of technology and that's the first three weeks of the course. Module one will discuss the culture, technology and ingenuity or often called engineering. Module 2 will talk about history of medieval technology from the end of the Roman Empire till about the 14th, 15th century. Then we'll talk in Module 3 about the history of modern technology. The whole purpose for studying the history of technology is to, to truly understand at a deeper level the impact of technology in, in, in society, socially and culturally. We'll realize that technology does shape culture as well as culture shaping technology. It's often called technological determinism. Part two will focus on the engineering professionalization, how engineering developed in the 19th century and 20th centuries into quite a robust profession um, and how the functional disciplines emerged. In module five, we'll talk about engineering and the capitalist system and in the 1920s and 30s there were reformists who tried to get engineers to challenge the capitalist system because they, had, they were the true drivers of industry and had all the intellectual and, not, and power and knowledge. But uh, the reformers insinuated that the engineers were being exploited. They were mere wage slaves. So we're going to be looking at the role of the engineers in the capitalist system. And then module six will be the, we'll get into the history of education and the formation of engineers in various countries, mainly English speaking. We will also talk about the Latin countries and Germany and France and Italy. Part three talks about engineering identity and in that we'll talk about philosophies of nature, uh, a philosophy of design and change and innovation, for example. A, Philosoph Greek philosophy focused on truths that could not be refuted. So the area of a circle had a certain equation. That was called philosophy. And philosophy to the Greeks was a truth that could not be proven wrong. It was infallible. So anything to do with change, workers building things, that was perceived to be non-intellectual activity. But we're seeing that that simplistic view of knowledge is being completely turned upside down in the 21st century, in fact in the last 500 years, where we are going through massive amounts of technological change and that change itself is a philosophy. Innovation by definition is a philosophy and engineering as a profession within it have to, has to understand and master that philosophy of change. So one has to reflect on what is change and why does it happen and how do you manage it, etc. So we'll talk about that. We'll explore it. Module 8, we'll talk about who are engineers, how do they think and why. Module 9, the invisible profession. It's been called the stealth profession by uh, a former Augustine guy called, from Lockheed Martin, former chief executive office call, officer called uh, Norm Augustine called engineering the stealth profession and it's also been called the invisible profession because basically it's removed. So all the public deals with the doctors, that's their front line so they know what doctors do but they don't ever question the artifacts that the doctors use to provide health, the MRIs, the heart valves, the prosthesis, the new engineered health systems that are all done behind the scenes, no one ever questions where that comes from. So that's why engineering has been given the name the stealth profession or the invisible profession. Theme four will talk about the role of engineering in society in the 21st century. So we're leading up to what my previous presentation dealt with, the future renaissance engineer. We'll talk about ethical responsibilities for engineers. We'll dig into that. Then we'll also look in module 11 on licensing 
regulation, registration and culture, we'll find that the, cult, the engineering profession culture in Canada is very different than that in the UK and they're both different than that in the United States because they're regulated and governed very differently by the state or the province and in the UK particularly by the employers that really dominate the profession. In module 12, we'll look at basically the engineer as a humanitarian. We'll look at e ecological engineering as an emerging field and sustainability. So here, here's an individual more detail on each module. This is slide three, module zero, orientation and planning. In it, I will be talking about my own background and I'll also talk about critical, paper, critical review papers and how you go about assessing a paper, reading it, and then writing a critical review. All of this information, by, this, by the way, is on the course website in, in Blackboard. We'll also talk about how you assess and your, how you're assessed and how your assignments are uh, distributed. All these courses require you to work in teams and depending on the size of the class could be two teams to seven, eight, nine teams. Usually four to five people per team, three to five people per team is about the, the, the optimum. And you'll be self-directed on what projects you choose but they will be on the theme of history and philosophy of engineering. And there again is slide four, module one, culture technology. So what is technology and what is culture? We're going to ask those fundamental questions. We're going to go back to Greek language like techni versus logos, which, is, which are the terminologies that make up the word technology. We're going to explore what those mean and they all come from the Greek language. Soft determinism and then hard technological determinism. We'll, also, we'll talk about Karl Marx as a, we'll explore Karl Marx as a technological determinist and then the rise of science and technology studies. Uh, you'll find that many of the again, major universities have a history and philosophy of technology and science. In module two, I want you to know as well, each of these modules could be courses and even whole degrees in their own right. For example, module two is the history of medieval technology. This is easily, and I've taken it as a whole university graduate course over 14 weeks. And in this one, we're going to look at the mechanical clock and its impact on medieval society. We're going to look at the print press and how the print press completely changed the order of society and led to books, the sharing of knowledge. And, what, and we'll look at the social impact of that. Lots of scholarly work has been done on these subjects, as well as on gunpowder that I mentioned earlier. Gunpowder, of course, was invented in China in the 5th, 5th 6th century. Very rarely was it, it was never used as a weapon in China. Fireworks, and it was even used for healing properties, they thought. It wasn't until the 15th, 16th century that it was used in Europe to blow places up. Why is that? Why did that happen and what was the impact? So we will explore the gunpowder. On its own, it could be a whole year's worth of study. And we'll also look at some military innovations all the way back to the Roman uh, machines, etc., and up to the modern times and how you know, technology has shaped war. There's lots of academic scholars who just specialize on the history of technology and specifically in war. Slide six, module three, history of modern technology. Well, we'll look at three revolutions and we'll drill down into them. Industrial revolution, driven by steam. The second industrial revolution, that was the first was steam. The second is electricity in the late 1800s. And the third is the industrial revolution that deals with information age and computers. Basically, the time we're in now, we're probably moving into a fourth industrial revolution or a fourth transformational revolution to do with knowledge, knowledge society. Module four, slide seven, the rise of engineering functional disciplines. You'll find that we'll talk about the ages of engineering from the dark ages through to the American experience, uh, geography of inventions in engineering, and 
We'll talk about engineers before the scientific revolution. They're often referred to, both architects and engineers were often referred to one another by that name. Some people call them engineers, some call them architects. Uh, during the days of Rome uh, and through the medieval times. And then through, after the Industrial Revolution, particularly in Britain, engineering was institutionalized. First with the institution of civil engineers in 1818, and then as machines became more complex and uh, evolved more and then became trains, etc., the institution of mechanical engineers George Stevenson in 1847. These institutions exist today in the same disciplines as were developed in the early part of the 19th century. One wants to question, why is that? Why are they still disciplines that were shaped in a, 100 years, 150 years ago? If we're calling for multidisciplined engineers, why do we have these institutions? that are still designed around 200-year-old uh, uh, concepts of how the world worked. Module 5, Engineers in the Capitalist System. As I said before in my lecture, Victorian engineers were heroes in Britain. How come engineers today are not the most popular engineer among school children in, in British schools was a car mechanic and a soap opera called Coronation Street, and the car mechanic was called Kevin Webster. And when young British school children, who's the most famous British engineer alive today, they said Kevin West, Webster. And this is a car mechanic in a soap opera who actually has been disgraced in recent time because of his own private life. Railroad engineers, of course, led to huge, huge amounts of business development. They opened up the Western United States and so it, the rise of engineering in the 19th century, really it became professionalized. It all kicked off, by the way, in the late 18th century in France, where military engineers sought more recognition for their role in the military. And of course, the establishment of the famous polytechnic system out of France. We'll talk about the engineering revolt in the early 20th century America. So this is all under the engineering capitalist system. Slide nine, education and formation of engineers from craft guilds, medieval guilds in the 12th and 13th century to a science-based profession. We talked about it a little in the previous lectures, but in this one, in this module, we're gonna be drilling down into great depth. There's lots of papers to read. We're gonna talk about know-how versus know-what. Know-how is the tacit knowledge that craftsmen pass on, but know-what and know-why brings in a more scientific approach to engineering. From the apprenticeship system, we're going to talk, look at the implications when we move from apprenticeship, five, six year apprenticeships, through to a university training only. And we'll also look at the differences between a chartered engineer in the British Commonwealth countries, like Australia, Canada, the United Kingdom, the Republic of Ireland, not the Commonwealth, but they do have basically built their system based on the British system. And we'll compare that and contrast that to the professional engineering license that's prevalent in North America and in Canada. And we'll find that these two systems are entirely different and they've created totally different engineering cultures and governance. And then we'll look at the, the whole rise of the concept of the European engineer as a licensing or as a, as a title among people as part of the countries part of the European community. We'll also explore the gaps in engineering education. Module seven focuses the philosophy of nature, design, change, and innovation. So the questions we'll ask is what is philosophy of engineering? Why does philosophy matter? Who are the players in the societies? And why we need it? That's in slide 10. Module eight, slide 11. Who are engineers and how do they think and why? There's lots of books Lots of academic papers written by American philosophers of engineering and historians that are looking at the identities of various engineers in society, what engineers learn and what they don't learn, what science versus engineering, what is science versus technology versus engineering. We'll get to explore that. I talked about it a little bit earlier. And then we'll talk about the engineer as artist. Of course, Leonardo da Vinci 
is claimed by artists to be an artist, he's claimed by architects to be an architect, he's claimed by engineers to be an engineer. Of course he was all of them, he was a polymath. He was, uh, of course he was a great painter. So we'll explore the engineer as artist and we'll start with Da Vinci. We'll be starting with Da Vinci. Module 9, The Invisible Profession, and I've called it The Status and Discontents, The Case of the British Engineers, to, from Victorian Heroes to On Cool. Lots of literature on this, like endless amounts of literature, lots of studies, especially from the early 1990s. It actually goes back to the 1930s, the discontent in, engineer, in the engineering profession. But we'll be looking at many uh, Royal Academy papers and academic papers from various institutions that have been written. There's lots of them I've gathered up over the last 30 years. We're going to question, okay, so all this stuff has been studied to death, so why has nothing been done? Why have changes not been made? Why have these academics and researchers have highlighted the problems of the image of engineers, the, the, the discontents, the status? Why has nothing improved? We're going to study that as well. Why has, uh, why has there been resistance to change in the professional institutions? The British media and engineering's perception, the BBC, we'll look at that. I particularly look at engineering in the UK simply because it was the birthplace of the professionalization of engineering, other than the French military. It was the birthplace of it, and it was where the true engineering itself really got its kickstart. But it's where engineering today has, has declined quite considerably, and, and it's today where the school children have absolutely no interest in it. So that's why we'll, we'll look at the special case of Britain, but we'll also look at the role in other countries, Canada, and America, and, and uh, Germany. We'll also look at how the profession is governed, specifically in these different countries. We'll realize that many employers resist licensing because they don't want to lose control. For example, in the United States, the license is given out by the state. In Canada, it's self-regulated. In other words, the engineering profession hand the license out, but in the United States, it's the state gives you a license to practice, mainly for consulting engineers, but most employers will not recognize the requirement for that because they don't want engineers to get too much power or authority, and they don't even want them to form unions. In Britain, there is no licensing process at all, other than for mechanics, like aircraft mechanics that are called maintenance engineers and other special so, so, like gas fitters, they're called gas engineers, but they're, of course they're maybe two years of training. So stark comparisons of the engineering profession and how it's governed worldwide. Module 10 will look at ethical responsibilities, arguments and counter arguments. What is it to be a professional? What does it mean to, to have a code of ethics, to have a body of knowledge that one adheres to? How do professions differ and why do they differ? And we'll look at whistleblowers. What does whistleblowing mean? Now we know that there's a few cases of whistleblowers in the news and one of them just got 35 years in the United States for whistleblowing secrets from the American military and defense. Was, that, was he a whistleblower or was he a traitor? To some people he was a whistleblower and did a good deed and to others he was a traitor. The state believes he's a traitor. Now, by the way, it should refer to her because she has changed as uh, no longer a female. She's not a, no longer a male. She's not a female. Um, we'll look at engineering ethics and social values. Module 11, um, we'll look at licensing regulation. And I've talked about that. So we'll look at the self-governing nature of licensing in, the, in Canada versus the state registration and licensing in the United States. Module 12, slide 15, we'll look at the humanitarianism, sustainability and ecology. What are the competencies of the engineer of the future? What is a humanitarian engineer? Henry Petrosky, the famous American philosopher of engineering and civil engineer, wrote a book, To Engineer is to be Human. To Engineer is Human. And we'll be looking at those kinds of uh, scholarly works and we'll even look at the Cold War versus the 21st century and the changes that have occurred in society. So basically that's the syllabus um, 
I'll quickly show you some of the readings. Actually, I won't show you the readings. The readings for each, the, the possible readings are in the important documents field on the course website. And in my next presentation, I'll tell you the actual requirements for the course. For example, you have to write three critical reviews, a project report, and then in-class presentations. Thank you very much.